friends, we've just been feasting uh, at a table that will not run out of food, and we've been drinking from a well that's never going to run dry. Dr. Long has commended himself already to you. Uh, any um, sort of resume, curriculum, vita introduction would be superfluous. Uh, he's a summer United Methodist, he said. And so uh, in one sense, uh, he's Wesleyan at least uh, when we think of uh, uh, John Wesley as having been a man of one book. Did not our hearts burn as this man opened the book to us? Would you receive Dr. Long as he comes again? Well, thank you um, for this wonderful experience of uh, Lakeside and the West Ohio Conference. I hope you know what you've got here. There, there's a great spirit in this place. And it's been good for this old canker sore of a soul Presbyterian to uh, <laughs> be able to feel some of that. We're spending some time at the intersection of Church Street and Ecclesial Boulevard. There are four churches there, the Church of St. Mark, the Church of St. Matthew, the Church of St. Luke, and the Church of St. John. Uh, yesterday, we had the privilege of spending a few minutes in the pews of the Church of St. Mark, and it exposed our brokenness, the presumption that we have, that if somehow, you know, we could elect just the right delegates, arrange them in just the right committees and adequately finance them, we could bring in the kingdom. Uh, it is, of course, a functional atheism to presume that. Uh, or as the prophet Isaiah would point out, it's a kind of idolatry because he made fun of the Canaanite gods. When trouble comes, you have to load them on the back of donkeys and take them out of town. And then Isaiah proclaimed the same good news that Mark's church breaks open for us. The God of Israel says, you don't carry me, I carry you. We do what we can then to be a part of what God is about in the world. And then we went across the street to the Church of St. Matthew and it exposed our brokenness, our willingness to settle for an immature faith, a superficiality, a refusal to be a church that's the salt of the earth. And then we were broken open with the good news that God is building us into a community that is like yeast, that sabotages the corruption in the world and is a community of righteousness. Now, you may have been tempted to transfer your membership into one of these two churches, uh, I, but we've got two more to go. And I hope that at the end of the day, you won't feel like you have to choose, but that you will see a bit of the flavor of all of these churches reflected in your common life. Now, uh, this morning, we're going to start by going catter corner across the street to the Church of St. Luke. And the thing that we notice first about the Church of St. Luke is that its main building on the campus is not a sanctuary like the Church of St. Mark, not even an educational building like the Church of St. Matthew, it's the fellowship hall. <laughs> because in the Church of St. Luke, the main way they experience the joy of the faith and the presence of the risen Christ is in eating and drinking with Jesus. The Greek Orthodox Church has a great saying that right now in heaven, there is a fabulous party going on. The table is laden with food. The best wine is flowing. The saints are swinging from the chandeliers, <laughs> shouting hallelujah. And every now and then, the floors of heaven open up and that party crashes down into ordinary time and space. And we call that Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a Super Bowl party, it's the heavenly banquet that crashes down. This is the Jubilee year in the Church of St. Luke. You know the Jubilee year when if you have a debt, it's canceled. If you're a slave, you're free. If you have wronged someone, it is forgiven. This is the Jubilee year. It comes out of the abundance of God's future being experienced as an overflow in the present. I have a friend, Scott Johnston, who was a pastor in Atlanta, and a few years ago, he was called to be the pastor of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. He arrived in August of 2008. In October of 2008, the world came apart economically. 
And Scott said, if you think people were nervous in Atlanta or Cincinnati about that, you should have been in New York, the financial capital of the world. People were on edge. Not only that, but the Fifth Avenue Church had just taken on a huge mortgage to build an outreach center and an educational facility. He said, I had one panic struck officers meeting after another, and they would always end the same way. We'd get to the end of the meeting and the chair would say, okay, I think we've got it as long as another shoe doesn't drop. But of course, you remember those terrible months, another shoe would drop. And we'd have another panic struck officers meeting and it would end, okay, I think we've got it now as long as another shoe doesn't drop. Scott said, I was doing okay with it. I was being a good pastor to them, calming them down. But one afternoon, I lost it. I was in my office all by myself, and I got afraid that we weren't going to make it, that my leadership was not going to be enough. And he said, I put my head down on my desk, and I prayed, and the spontaneous prayer that came out of my mouth was, Oh, God, please, no more shoes. <laughs> no sooner had I uttered it than there was a knock on the door. It was the sexton saying, Dr. Johnson, I think you better come down right now to the overnight shelter. They have a little overnight shelter for homeless people. He said, so I went down there, and there standing at the door of the shelter were two uniformed New York City police officers, and I thought, oh, no, now what? And one of them said, Pastor, we have just raided an illegal factory in Brooklyn. They were making counterfeit Timberland boots. We've got 700 pairs of shoes here. <laughs> he said, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. This God is full of abundance. It is jubilee year, and we are gathered at the table of God in the church of St. Luke. And it's because even in the present, we can see on the horizon the great victory of God that is coming. When I was a teenager growing up in Atlanta, there would always be one Saturday afternoon in the fall when I would engage in a strange ritual I would sit on the red clay bank overlooking US 29 on the outskirts of Atlanta, which was near my home. The reason I would sit on that bank is because there would be one Saturday in the fall when the Ku Klux Klan would gather on Stone Mountain. They would spew their hate and burn a cross, and then they would get in their cars and go down US 29 into downtown Atlanta, honking their horns in arrogance. And then in downtown Atlanta, they would pull their hoods over their faces and they would march in all their hubris and hate down Auburn Avenue, which was Main Street in black Atlanta. And the citizens of Auburn Avenue would close their windows and shutter their doors because you didn't know who was behind that hood might be your boss, might be the president of the trust company of Georgia. You couldn't tell who was in the Klan. But then one year in the early 1960s, we began to see on the horizon the dawning of God's great victory. The first shoots of green in the desert of the civil rights movement were beginning to take flower. And that year, the Klan marched down Auburn Avenue, but the citizens of Auburn Avenue did not lock their doors or close their windows. They stood on the sidewalk, and they laughed and laughed and laughed. And the Klan has never marched down Auburn Avenue again. The laughter of the redeemed dethroned the powers and principalities. The theologian Jürgen Moltmann said, with Easter, the dance of the liberated and the laughter of the redeemed begins. And we experience that in the church of St. Luke as we gather around the Jubilee table for the great banquet. Now, when you're gonna have a banquet as the centerpiece of your church life, one of the things that you're concerned about is who is on the guest list? Who are we going to have seated at the table? 
Ann Tyler, the great novelist, wrote a wonderful book called Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant. It's about a dysfunctional family. The father has abandoned his wife and his three young children. Pearl is the wife, the abandoned wife. The three children are Jenny and Cody and Ezra. And Pearl is ambitious for them as a single mom. And so she puts pressure on them to succeed, and they do. Jenny becomes a pediatrician, but an unhappy one. Cody becomes a successful businessman, but a restless one. O only Ezra sees some other vision. He doesn't want to be the lawyer that his mother wants him to be. His dream in life is to own a restaurant. He works up from a busboy to a waiter to a cook, and finally he owns his own restaurant. And then his dream is, I want to have a meal where everybody in my family comes and sits at the table. I want my dad who abandoned us. I want my unhappy mom and sister, my estranged brother. I want all of us at the table. He has a meal and everybody comes, but then they get angry at each other and somebody leaves before the food is served. Or they have a meal and not everybody comes, but he keeps trying over and over because he wants the whole family to sit down together for a feast. It's the gospel of Luke because God wants the whole family of God, the whole dysfunctional family of God to come and gather around the table for a feast. That's why so much of the Gospel of Luke and also Acts is given over to the restoration of the guest list of God. People who feel left out and marginalized are called to the table in the Gospel of Luke. You may remember how Luke describes the crowd that gathered at Pentecost in Acts 2. It sounds a little like a bus station announcer. Who was there? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Pontius, Cappadocia, all aboard, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. There were Medes at Pentecost? This is the first century. There hadn't been any Medes in the world for hundreds of years. They were as extinct as mastodons. There were Elamites at Pentecost. They didn't wander over from the next town. They wandered over from the Old Testament. <laughs> to say that there were Medes and Elamites at Pentecost was like saying, you should have been at our Methodist church last Sunday. We had visitors from Florida, Texas, California, a whole van load of Assyrians and a cute little Hittite couple who signed the friendship. <laughs> Everybody who ever lived was at Pentecost. That's the guest list of God. Everybody who ever lived experienced the power of the Spirit. That's why in the Gospel of Luke and in the Church of St. Luke, they preach about that shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of them wandered off, and the shepherd said, I'm going to leave the 99 in the wilderness unprotected and go looking after the one lost sheep that has wandered away. Now, no respectable shepherd operates like that. This is a parable, not a manual for shepherding. <laughs> and in this parable, the only way you could have a shepherd who'd leave 99 unprotected and go after the wandering one is if you have a shepherd who has a huge heart for the lost. And in the church of St. Luke, they proclaim a Jesus who has a huge heart for the lost. I remember years ago when I was a young pastor in Atlanta, I had somebody in my congregation who was ill, who was at Emory University Hospital. And so I wanted to go visit her. And in those days, my parents lived near Emory University Hospital. And so I thought to myself, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll visit my parents and then I'll make my pastoral call at the hospital. So I visited with my parents. And after I'd been there a few minutes, I said, well, I guess I better be moving on. I I've got somebody who's at Emory Hospital and I need to visit her. And my mother said, one of my best friends who lives just around the corner has been at Emory Hospital for two weeks. I know she would dearly love to have a visit from you. Well, you can imagine how I reacted to that. 
I turned to my mother and I said, look, mom, I am a busy man. I have my own church now and I can't go around adjusting my schedule every time one of your bridge partners gets sick. Uh, uh, that, that, that wasn't exactly the way I put it to her. <laughs> I think the way I put it to her was, yes, mother, I'll be happy to visit your friend. <laughs> anyway, I made my visit and then I went to this woman's room and there was a sign on her door, no visitors, family only. So I went to the nurse's station and I explained the situation and the head nurse said, let me check. So she went into the room and she came out and said to me, she'd like to see you. So I went into the room and there she was, frail, bird-like, her eyes darting around the room, pillows behind her head. And I said, hi, you don't know me, I'm Tom Long, I'm a Presbyterian minister, but you know my mother and that's all I got out. And she said, what is the meaning of the biblical name Elisha? I panicked, I was a young pastor, I couldn't remember my Hebrew, finally a little of it came back. El means God, Ish means human being, El Ish Ah, man of God, it means man of God. That's not what it means, but uh, <laughs> it satisfied her. She said, sit down, I've been looking for a minister who knows something. <laughs> And I found out behind that bravado was a very frightened woman facing a terminal illness who had not been visited by anyone from her church in two weeks, not even her pastor. So I read a psalm to her, I had a prayer and I promised I'd come back. A Couple of days later I did go back and the sign on the door had changed. It said, no visitors, family only. And then there was a flower drawn with a crayon and under that was the word, please. I went to the nurse's station and she said, let me check. She went in, she came out, she said she'd like to see you. And when I went in there, I found she was struggling with her faith and doubting in the face of this terrible illness. And so I read a psalm of comfort and we prayed and I promised I'd come back. And a couple of days later, I went back and the sign on the door had changed again. This time it said, no visitors, family only, and the crayon had marked out the flower and the pleas, and the words were written, and this means you. I went to the nurse's station. She said, let me check, and she came out and said, she doesn't want to see anybody. And that afternoon, all by herself, she went across the river to the other side, and the frail hands of a young pastor couldn't hold on. But at her funeral, we were bold to sing hymns of resurrection because we believe on the other side of the river there was a good shepherd searching for that wandering lamb. And when he found her, he put her up on his strong shoulders and he brought her home. In the church of St. Luke, we celebrate a God who has a huge heart for the lost. Now, theologians debate, and you may wish to debate, is the theologian behind the Gospel of Luke and Acts, is he a universalist or not? Now, uh, we'll leave that debate for the theologian, but one thing that is not in doubt is whether Luke is universalist in theology, he is universalist in practice. That is to say, if you are worshiping in the church of St. Luke, you ought to say to yourself, the verdict about each human being I leave to the mystery and wisdom of God, but I will treat every single person I encounter as a lamb of God. Amen. You know, there's this wonderful scene in the 15th chapter of Acts. The church is having a debate and it has gone all the way up to uh, annual conference. <laughs> And the debate is about whether Gentiles can be brought into the community of faith. And at the annual conference, there are speeches made, impassioned speeches made, there are pro-Gentile speeches made, and there are anti-Gentile speeches made. And then finally, Peter comes to the microphone. 
and Peter makes a powerful pro-Gentile speech, and the place is silent. And then James, the brother of Jesus, who is presiding, stands up and says, we have all been moved by what our brother Simeon has said. <laughs> Simeon, that's not his name. His name is Peter, Simon Peter, but nowhere else is he ever called Simeon. Simeon, Simeon, ding, 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 ding. Second chapter of Luke, old man in the temple. In comes the holy family. He's been looking for the comfort of Israel and he goes over and he says when he sees this child, you can let your servant go now because I have seen with my own eyes your salvation. This child will be a light to the Gentiles. It was there in the beginning. The table of God in the church of St. Luke is broad. Now, when my wife and I moved to Atlanta, we looked around for a church that we could worship at and be a part of, and we found Central Presbyterian Church in downtown Atlanta. We liked it because it had a justice ministry. It was right downtown. It had good worship, all the things that we were looking for. Our pastor invited us and all of the others who were joining this church during a particular season to meet on Wednesday night with the session, the officers of the church for dinner. We were in a rectangular table in the fellowship hall and after we had eaten, our pastor stood up and said, I'd like us to go around the table and I'd like for each of you to say, why are you joining Central Presbyterian Church? So we did, the first person stood and said, well, I'm a tenor and I love the music program here and I'm looking forward to being part of the choir. The next person said, we've got two teenage daughters and the youth group here is reportedly hot and we're looking for a place where they can belong. And the next person said, I didn't like the minister in the church I was in, but I like the minister here fine, and so I'm joining Central. And that's the way it went until it got around to Marshall. Ponytail, studs in the ears. His story was that he had stumbled in off the street high on crack cocaine, begging for help at the outreach center. And the director of the outreach center took his hands and said, I haven't got enough budget this month to get you in a treatment program, but if you stay with us, we'll stay with you and I'll get you in a program next month. And they knelt on the office floor and they prayed and he stayed and he said, the reason I'm here is I've been sober for three years. I'm joining this church because God saved me in this church. We all looked... We all looked at each other sheepishly. We were there for the music and the parking. He's there for the salvation. <laughs> Six weeks later, there was a squib in our church newsletter that Marshall was an inmate in the DeKalb County Jail. We had joined the church together. We were brothers in Christ, so I went to see him. Three metal detectors later, I found myself on the opposite side of a thick piece of plate glass. I was holding a telephone on the other side of the glass in an orange prisoner jumpsuit was Marshall holding a phone. I said, Marshall, how are you doing? By the grace of God, I'm doing okay. What happened, Marshall? I was in the outreach center, he said, counseling people off the street people like myself, and I was telling them, listen, there's hope. You can do better, you can do better. And I realized that I hadn't done entirely better or entirely right myself. I had an old warrant out here in DeKalb County. It was so old, nobody would ever have caught up with me with it, but I knew about it, and so on Christmas Eve, I turned myself in. But I'll be out by Easter. And I cannot wait to worship God on Easter. He said, in the meantime, I've got a little outreach center going here in my cell. <laughs> he said, a lot of these people can't read or write, and so we write letters to their wives and sweethearts telling how much they love them and, and miss them. And we have a prayer meeting every night. Not many come, but we pray for the fellow prisoners and even for the guards. And I'm looking through a plate glass window at a guy in a DeKalb County prison jumpsuit, and I don't think I have ever seen anyone more free because he was around the table in the church of St. Luke experiencing the jubilee 
of a Savior who finds the lost and the least. Now, if you're going to go to the table at the Church of St. Luke, not only do you wonder about the guest list, which is wider than we have ever imagined, but we also have to have prayer before we eat. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, prayer is at least as important, if not more important, than in any of the other Gospels. It is a powerful discerning force in Luke's Gospel. Now, it is amazing to me, as a person who sometimes teaches worship, how little real prayer there is in the church. If you will listen to people pray in worship, you can sometimes tell they are not really praying. They're just talking to you in a stained glass voice. One of my colleagues prayed in chapel one day several years ago. Oh Lord, we pray for the victims in war-torn Bosnia, formerly Yugoslavia. Now, I know the maps in the Bible are out of date, but I think God probably knows that Bosnia used to be. <laughs> there are a number of places in the Gospel of Luke where prayer is lifted up in all of its power, but perhaps none more powerful than the 18th chapter of Luke, where Jesus tells us a story. And before Jesus tells us a story, Luke says, now Jesus told this story that we might pray always and not lose heart. Wow. Wow. Now, in preaching class, we tell students, when you tell a story in a sermon, don't explain it. It's like a joke. If you have to explain it, it loses its power. Luke did not get the memo. <laughs> he says, Jesus is about to tell you a story, and this is the point of it, that you pray always and not lose heart. Now, the story that he tells is about an absolutely horrible judge, a judge who hates God and hates humanity. He doesn't go to church. He doesn't give to the United Way. And appearing in his courtroom is a poor widow. This is the first century, and a poor widow means she has nothing. She has no husband. She has no money. She has no status. She has no power. She probably couldn't get justice in a good court, and she's appearing before the worst judge in the county. Well, I said she has nothing. That's not exactly right. She did have one thing, yeah. the capacity to annoy. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you only have one thing, you use it. And so she stands up in the back of the court, give me justice, give me justice. I imagine she left messages on his voicemail, give me justice. <laughs> She was out there at the country club standing beside the ball washer when he was trying to tee off. Give me justice, give me justice. And so the judge engages in one of those soliloquies we find in Luke's church, and he says to himself, but so we can hear it, I hate God, I hate people, I hate that miserable widow, but I'm going to give her justice so she will not wear me out. Now, that's the beautiful story that Jesus tells that we might pray always and not lose heart. Now, what are we supposed to get out of that? Well, maybe we're supposed to enter that story from the point of view of the judge. I mean, Jesus does say, pay attention to what the unjust judge says. And if you pay attention to what the unjust judge says, well, he's not a just judge, but at the end of the day, he gives justice. And maybe it reminds us that we live in a world where God rules and overrules. And at the end of the day, even despite the corruption out there, well, that's part of it, I think. But if that were all of it, then the motto would be, take heart. But this is pray always and not lose heart. Well, maybe we're supposed to enter this thing from the point of view of that feisty widow, and she is feisty. In fact, the metaphor used for her insistent rattling of the judge's cage is a boxing metaphor. She pummels him. Give me justice. Give me justice. And what he says in the end is, I better give her justice. She's about to give me a black eye. <laughs> maybe what Jesus is trying to tell us is he wants us to pray like that wants us to pray like we're pounding at the doors of heaven. There's a great new biography out of Edward Bennett Williams. I don't know whether you remember that name or not. He was a powerful criminal attorney in Washington, D.C. He was Nixon's Watergate lawyer. 
He made enough money at it. He bought the Washington Redskins. He was a player. In the biography, there's an incident where Mother Teresa comes to visit Edward Bennett Williams. Why? She was raising money for an AIDS hospice. And Williams and his law partner, Paul Dietrich, had a little tax dodge foundation, and she wanted some money from it. Before she came, William said to Dietrich, Dietrich, I'm dreading this. I don't want to see this so-and-so from the Roman Catholic Church. AIDS is not my favorite disease. I don't want to give her any money. <laughs> Dietrich said, just calm down, Ed. Let's just treat her politely, and then when she's finished making her pitch, we'll tell her, we've made all of the grants we can for the year. We don't have any more money. So Mother Teresa comes, it must have been quite a sight, the little sparrow of Calcutta sitting on one side of a big mahogany desk, these two power attorneys on the other side. Mother Teresa made her appeal for the AIDS hospice, and William said, Sister, we're moved by what you say. We're touched that you've come, but we don't have any money. We've made all of our allocations for the year. Mother Teresa simply said, let us pray. <laughs> Williams didn't know what to do, and Dietrich said, bow your head, Ed, bow your head. <laughs> and when she finished the prayer, she made word for word the same appeal for the AIDS hospice. And Williams said, we're moved by what you say, but we've, we've already made our grants for the year. To which Mother Teresa said, let us pray. <laughs> To which William said, Dietrich, give me my checkbook. <laughs> she comes like a boxer. Maybe that's how we ought to pray. But if that were the only thing, that's part of it, but if that were the only thing, the motto of this would be pray always. But it's pray always and not lose heart. Because the story that Jesus is telling us in the church of St. Luke is not really about the judge. It's not even about the widow. It's about God. And it is, if a woman who has no power can at the end of the day wangle justice from a judge who has no honor, how much more will you, children of the heavenly king, receive everything you need from the hands of the God who knows the numbers of the hairs on your head, who knitted you together in the womb? I heard a story the other day about a young boy who was walking down the Mississippi River one day, and he happened to notice down in the river a Huckleberry Finn-looking kind of guy who was tying some logs together with a rope. And he said to him, what are you doing? Huck Finn said, I'm making me a raft. I'm going to float out there to that island in the middle of the river. I dare you to go with me. <laughs> well, boys don't turn down dare, so... The other boy got down in the river with him and they got on the raft, but it was not well made and the current was treacherous. And before they got to the island, the raft came apart. And so they barely managed to swim and land on the shore of the island to which they were going. And then they were in despair. It was getting late in the day. Nobody knew they were there. The island was deserted and they didn't know what they were gonna do. Just at that moment, one of those old paddle wheelers was coming down the Mississippi and so the boy who'd been walking on the bank jumped up and went to the shore and began jumping up and down and crying for help. And Huck Finn said, don't waste your breath. They can't see you. And even if they could, we're just two little old boys over here. They wouldn't pay any mind to it. And just at that moment, the paddle wheeler shifted direction and began making for the island. And Huck Finn said, how'd you do that? The other boy said, well, there's something you don't know. The captain of that boat is my father. <laughs> There's something I want you to know in the church of St. Luke. The captain of this boat is our heavenly father. And so pray always and don't lose heart. And then the last thing you do when you're gathered around the dinner table in the church of St. Luke is they pass the basket at the end. There's more material in the gospel of Luke on economic justice than anywhere else almost in the scripture. And the one thing that is happening when you're passing the basket at the great banquet table is that it undoes our notion of charity. My colleague Luke Johnson says there are actually two ethics of economics in the Gospel of Luke. One is sell everything you have and give it to the poor. The other is share possessions. 
Well, what is it? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor or share possessions? Luke Johnson says, for the gospel of Luke, it's sell everything you have and give it to the poor because you own nothing. Everything is from the hand of God. But the way you make that practical is to share possessions, which means that overcomes charity. It's not nine for me and one for God. It's everything for God, and we share that as we pass the basket. One of my students at Princeton Seminary went home for the Christmas holidays. His father was a justice minister in Washington, D.C., and father and son spent Saturday morning one weekend talking about what his son was learning in seminary and then talking about his father's ministry. And he was saying the lines at the shelters are getting longer and the church's hearts and the public's hearts are growing colder. And then after they had talked, the father and son decided that they wanted to get some exercise. So they went for a walk, jog around the neighborhood. And as they turned the corner to come back to the house, they said to each other, why don't we call the pizza uh, parlor and have them deliver a pizza? It'll be there just about the time that we get home. So they started over, this was payphone days, they started over toward the payphone. But standing between them and the payphone was a homeless man who said, I'm hungry. Can you spare anything? Well, they'd been talking about it all morning. And so the father reached into both of his pockets and pulled out big handfuls of change and said to the homeless man, here, take what you need. The homeless man looked delighted. He said, I'll take it all. And raked it off and started away. And then father and son realized they didn't have any change to use the telephone. So the father turned to the homeless man and said, excuse me, sir. We want to make a telephone call and we don't have any change. Could you spare a quarter? And the homeless man turned around and held out huge handfuls of the change and said, here, take what you need, take what you need. That's the church of St. Luke. It's not the powerful and the rich being charitable to the, it's sharing what belongs only to God. That's the Church of St. Luke. Now let's go across the street for one more visit. We'll do this quickly. We're running out of time. We must visit the Church of St. John, though. We don't want to miss it. And the interesting thing about the Church of St. John, the building there, you see, is, uh, well, actually, they, they, don't, they don't have a building. <laughs> <laughs> It's a kind of a house church, and uh, if you stand and listen to them worship, you can hear them, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. Because in the church of St. John, they experience Jesus Christ in the love of the community. Now, uh, Raymond Brown, the great New Testament scholar, said, of the churches, this one was the first to come apart because of the fragility of its premise. Already in First and Second, Third John, you have them saying to each other, how can you say you love God whom you haven't seen when you don't even love your brother and sister whom you have seen? It's a fragile premise. But I hope the Church of St. John is always with us because they understand that in the bonds of love, in the new commandment, love one another, there is the presence of Christ. It also means they've got a different sense of time in this church than they do in the other churches. There are no clocks on the wall in the church of St. John. You see, in, in Mark and Matthew and Luke, let's take Matthew for example, the kingdom of heaven is in the future. We're not there yet. We live in a Good Friday world. We're marching to Zion, beautiful. We're not there yet. But one day we will be. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Okay, it's coming in the future. John reaches out and takes that future kingdom and pulls it like a canopy over ordinary time. And he says, let me tell you, for Matthew, the kingdom is out there. But for me, the kingdom is up here, above us. And like a sewing machine, the kingdom keeps coming down into ordinary time and you experience the fullness of the thing itself. That's why there's that scene in the 11th chapter of John where Martha goes out to Jesus who is late to Lazarus' funeral and says to her, 
If you had been here, my brother would not have died, to which Jesus says, your brother will rise, to which Martha says, I know he will rise at the last day, to which Jesus says, no, that's the gospel of Matthew. We're in the gospel of John here. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I am so glad that both of these temporal perspectives exist at the intersection of the two roads because Matthew helps me watch CNN. I don't live in an Easter world, and Matthew helps me watch CNN, but John helps me understand ecstasy. How you can be in Walmart on Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock and somebody says something to a clerk and suddenly the veil parts and there is the thing itself. A number of years ago, I wrote a brilliant article for a magazine <laughs> on children in worship. And I said, from the time that a child is old enough to be in one place for an hour without a change of diaper, they ought to be in the full worship of the people of God. And our worship ought to be intergenerational. We ought not pander to the young, but include the young in all of our worship because our worship is like the sound of music. It has children's parts. Well, a few weeks after it was published, a Christian educator in Michigan called me and said, my Christian education committee read your article. We thought it was wonderful. I said, thank you so much. She said, and we'd like you to come to Michigan and show us how to do it. I said, well, I was just writing an article and I, I <laughs> she said, no, no, you got to come on and show us. So I went up there and we planned an intergenerational worship service. Let me tell you how it was going to work. Sunday afternoon, down in the fellowship hall, round tables, on each table there was yeast and water and flour, and uh, the families were going to gather around those tables, and as I preached an intergenerational sermon, they were going to be making uh, bread dough with the yeast and the flour and the water, and then that bread dough was going to be taken to ovens in the kitchen and baked into bread, and when the bread... Uh, the aroma of it wafting through the fellowship hall, and then they were going to bring the bread loaves out, and we were going to have communion with it. Isn't that great? <clears throat> it was a disaster. <laughs> it had been raining all weekend. People were in a foul mood. Children were throwing wads of dough around the, around the room. Something went wrong with the ovens. That bread took an eternity to bake. I had to pad that sermon and pad it and pad it. And finally, with chairs falling over and children screaming and parents at wit's end, we finally got to the end of this fool thing. And the script called for me to say, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I was too tired to think of anything else. So I said, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And there was a little girl in the back of the room who is a member of the Church of St. John because she said, it already is. In the middle of the chaos, it already is. That's why the Gospel of John is the only one to begin in poetry. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then shoo, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I was taught in seminary that good worship is powerful word punctuated by music. But in the church of St. John, it goes the other way around. It's powerful music punctuated by words. My racquetball partner in Princeton was a United Church of Christ minister, and he went to a conference like this one summer, and we were playing racquetball afterwards, and he said, let me tell you what happened at opening worship. He said the minister was trying an experimental sermon. He would preach for a page, and then we'd sing the stanza of a hymn, and then he'd preach another page, and we'd sing the second stanza of the hymn, and then a third and so on, and it was going horribly. <laughs> He said, I happened to be seated next to my old theology professor from Yale, H. Richard Niebuhr. And I said to Dr. Niebuhr in the middle of this, God, this is terrible. This reminds me of something you said in class. 
<laughs> Neighbor said, what? I said, oh, you, you were teaching J.S. Whale's book, Christian Doctrine, and you said that Whale was a weak theologian because every time he encountered a theological problem he couldn't solve, he'd quote a hymn. And Niebuhr said, I was wrong. I was young and I was brash and I was wrong. I have discovered there are some things in theology you cannot say except in hymns. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The great poetry and ecstasy of the faith in the Church of St. John. The Church of St. Mark, the Church of St. Matthew, the Church of St. Luke, and the Church of St. John. Thanks be to God, the churches of Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs>